In China, voices of discontent growing against the current communist leadership. A Beijing-based expert and former member of the Chinese army talked with us about the challenges facing Xi Jinping. Taiwan's president and foreign ministry rejecting the World Health Organization's accusations of racial discrimination today. A reporter was questioned by President Trump on Wednesday about his background. Is what he told the president the real truth? In the U.S., New York sees a record high death toll for the third time this week. This comes amid slowing hospitalization rates. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. On April 8th, a large number of African people in the southern Chinese city Guangzhou were driven out by their landlords and had to stay on the streets. Another video shows many Africans dragging their luggage aimlessly through the streets of Guangzhou. One of them says, we are just walking on the road. They can't give us a house, they can't give us a hotel, and they cannot provide a place we can stay. It comes after all of the cases reported by Guangzhou authorities in April were reportedly related to African people. Chinese media have only reported about testing people from abroad. They haven't talked about testing locals. So we can't rule out the possibility that many of the locals are also infected, but it's not being reported. It's led to discrimination against Africans among local Chinese. Apartments won't be rented to black people anymore, not to foreigners. You don't see so many black people in San Yuan Li district now. I don't know where they've gone. One citizen says the Africans staying on the street are a potential safety threat and a virus transmission hazard. Guangzhou is likely going to be a catalyst that ignites southern China. The World Health Organization's general secretary lashed out at Taiwan, accusing the island of a racist campaign and death threats against him over the past three months. This comes as he faces growing criticism for his handling of the virus pandemic. This attack came from Taiwan. The foreign ministry also, they know the campaign. They didn't dissociate themselves. They even started criticizing me in the middle of all that insult and slur. President Trump on Wednesday questioned whether the U.S. should continue funding the WHO after the China-centric way it handled the virus outbreak. Petitions have been circulating for him to step down. Current WHO advisors have also questioned if the agency has followed China's positions too closely on the virus. And Taiwanese officials last month accused the WHO of ignoring warnings from them as early as December about the potential outbreak of the virus. The WHO never publicized that information as the WHO does not recognize Taiwan's statehood. Despite the lack of recognition from the WHO, Taiwan has enacted some of the most effective responses to the pandemic, logging just 379 cases and five deaths to date, far lower than many of its neighbors. Taiwan's president strongly protested the accusations of racism and even invited the general secretary to visit the island nation. In a Facebook post, Tsai Ing-wen wrote, For years, we have been excluded from international organizations, and we know better than anyone else what it feels like to be discriminated against and isolated. Taiwan's foreign ministry on Thursday condemned groundless accusations from the WHO chief that racist slurs against him had come from the island. China, meanwhile, has come to his defense. The Chinese foreign ministry spokesman said on Thursday that WHO has actively performed its responsibilities and played an important role in promoting global cooperation and fighting the epidemic, adding China will firmly support the WHO. Japan will spend $2 billion to move its manufacturing from China to other countries. Before the pandemic, China was Japan's biggest trading partner. But in February, imports were slashed by nearly half as factories in China shut down. The German foreign ministry has restricted the use of video conferencing software Zoom over security concerns. Officials are no longer allowed to have confidential conversations on the app. Zoom has come under fire for storing private encryption keys on servers in China. Experts say it poses a major security risk. Zoom saw a massive spike in users during the outbreak, jumping from 10 million daily users to 200 million.
But now the company is facing a lawsuit for misleading shareholders on its privacy and encryption standards. Three Chinese companies listed on the U.S. stock exchange are facing accounting scandals. Last week, Chinese coffee chain superbrand Luckin Coffee revealed that its chief operating officer fabricated about $300 million in sales in 2019. The company's value fell nearly 80 percent over the next two days. China's answer to Netflix, ITE, has been accused of inflating its 2019 revenue by over $1 billion. It's reportedly done this by exaggerating its user numbers by 42 to 60 percent and then faking expenses to explain where the extra revenue went. Investment company Muddy Waters Research supports the accusation. In response, ITE agreed its 2019 report contains numerous errors, unsubstantiated statements and misleading conclusions. The third Chinese company is Beijing-based Tal Education Group, Tal. The company said an employee conspired with external vendors to wrongly inflate light class sales by forging contracts and other documentations. Light class sales accounted for about 3 to 4 percent of the company's total revenues, or about $90 million in 2019. Discontent towards the CCP's handling of the virus is growing in China. A Beijing-based expert and former member of the Chinese army talked with NTD about the challenges facing Xi Jinping. Communist China's mishandling of the CCP virus raised voices from within China's political system, challenging Xi Jinping's legitimacy. A China expert says Xi is in a challenging situation. Long Jiefu is a former Chinese military member. He is also a former dean at the Department of Political Studies of a university in Beijing. He says five senior party officials recently wrote a letter to Xi Jinping saying it's risky for Xi to continue his censorship and hardline approach. They say Xi did not follow Deng Xiaoping's political legacy, which is to have a good relationship with the United States, keep a low profile, and try not to fight against the U.S. Li Ruhuan pointed out this problem and said this is pretty serious. The officials also reportedly warned Xi that if he sticks to his current approach, he might be taken down in the next political meeting in China this autumn or next spring. But Long said this is rather unlikely since China does not have any mechanism to hold the highest leader accountable. Long said over time Xi has become less willing to listen to criticism, so reform from inside is less likely. The key lies in the people. If the people can stand up and make their voices heard, then maybe there is a chance. If the people don't stand up, then there is no chance. International pressure against Xi is also increasing. Politicians and private lawyers from around the world are seeking compensation from the communist regime for its censorship, which allowed the virus to spread around the world. China should pay a severe price for that negligence. I'm a little upset with China, I'll be honest with you. In a rare statement, Xi asked the Chinese people on Wednesday to get mentally prepared for long-term change in the external environment. Long said it's hard for the communist leadership to avoid blame this time. You won't be able to argue the virus is contained when it is clearly not. As for whether you can avoid blame in the future, that's for an international court to decide. He said the Communist Party will always follow its playbook of cover-up and censorship during a crisis. It's written in the party's guiding principles, stability above everything else. Stability above everything else. What's included in this everything? It includes human lives. In order to maintain stability, people can be killed. In order to maintain stability, you didn't try to stop the virus spreading. Stability is the excuse the regime used to crack down on Tiananmen Square students and Hong Kong protesters. A Chinese netizen says it's probably better if the party does not reform. The netizen wrote on Twitter, I'm just afraid that the Communist Party reforms so that it can sustain its life for another 70 years. This evil organization must be eliminated, otherwise China can't be good nor can the world be safe. Penny Zhou, NTD News. Next, we have the heartbreaking story of a 22-year-old who got stuck in Wuhan during the lockdown and decided to help out as a security guard. NTD Xi Wenrong reports. 22-year-old Mr. Zhang says he'll never forget the scene he saw after a 90-year-old man died alone in his home. 
We called him in front of his door. You could hear the sound of the phone, the sound from the TV, but there was no one to open the door. When we broke the door down, we saw the old man was lying on the ground. The old man is dead. His children could not come back, so we contacted the ambulance directly to take him away. Zhang is a second-year college student from another province. He came to Wuhan for an accounting internship just before people knew the CCP virus was spreading. Zhang was trapped in the house and had nothing to do. He found work as a security guard for the lockdown in a nearby community, wanting to earn some extra money. For the first time, he was wearing a bulletproof vest and held an electric baton 16 hours a day. I don't dare tell my family about it. They still don't know I'm here. He added that he only changes his protective clothing at work once a week. Masks are worn for a longer period of time. He only changes it when it breaks. I have to do what I have to do. Help the elderly, help them carrying vegetables. We didn't think too much. He said in the community where he worked, 66 people were confirmed to have the CCP virus and 22 have died. The regime says since the outbreak, only about 3,000 people have died in Wuhan, but he doesn't trust that number. He said a person who worked in a makeshift hospital said they thought there were closer to 10,000 deaths in Wuhan. We ordinary people all know that there are 3,000 deaths are only clinical patients. They died in bed in hospitals. In fact, there are people who died before they got the bed in the hospital, and some who haven't received treatment at all. Videos online show people scattering money and jumping from buildings out of desperation. He said they are also victims of the CCP virus. Reporting by Shu and Rong, NTD News. For the second time this week, when questioned by President Trump, a reporter hid his connection to a media controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. At Wednesday's White House briefing, President Trump asked a reporter where he's from. So on behalf of uh, Good. Where are you from? Media. Where are you from? I'm from Taiwan. Good. Yeah. It's the second time this week the president has asked a reporter where they're from or who they work for. Who are you working for, China? And for a second time, the reporter is not telling the whole truth. When the reporter was replying to President Trump's question, obviously he wasn't really answering what the president was asking. The president seemed to be asking which outlet he works for, not where he's from personally. Ching Yi Chang was born in Taiwan and studied in Taiwan, but he works for Shanghai Media Group, a company owned by the Chinese regime. The company's former president, still a key person there, has deep ties with the Chinese Communist Party. Li Rui Gang is no ordinary party member. He was also once the party's deputy secretary general of Shanghai. On Monday, another reporter told the president she works for Phoenix yeah, TV. It, it, she said it's based in Hong Kong, Kong, but it supply. also has close ties so with the Chinese regime. A former news director with Phoenix TV, Chung Pong, says the U.S. government needs to do more to stop the regime from influencing U.S. media. The Phoenix TV reporter's question itself is propaganda. It's promoting the Chinese Communist regime's image to the U.S. government and other outlets around the world. In February, the State Department designated five Chinese state-run outlets as operatives of Beijing, but Pong says that's not enough. There are still many other media outlets that are part of the Chinese Communist Party's overseas propaganda strategy. According to Pong, these media companies serve the communist regime and their job is to maintain the party's image overseas. Poor quality protective equipment imported from China continues to cause scandal in Europe. Our France correspondent David Vives has the details. <laughs> the woman filming this nurse is laughing, but the situation is dramatic. On April 2nd, Health workers at Marseille La Timon Hospital had a shock when they opened up boxes of surgical gowns. These are our new gowns. Just look at this. We just took it out of the box. According to the woman on the phone, all of the boxes they were supposed to use that day contained gowns that were defective. We're going to fasten the belt. We already opened three boxes. 
These health workers work with children infected by the CCP virus. At the end of the video, the nurse says she will go on to test children for the virus. France is lacking personal protective equipment like masks and gowns. In a public hospital, La Timon in Marseille, healthcare workers use a single-use surgical gown for each time they enter a patient's room. The French government bought a hundred tons of medical equipment from China, including protective gowns, on March 29th. The video triggered a cascade of comments on social networks, with many people angry about the quality of the Chinese-made equipment. This is a Europe-wide problem. On April 8th, Finland said 2 million masks it received from China were faulty. David Vives, NTD News, Paris. The Department of Justice is urging the FCC not to allow a Chinese telecom company to provide telecommunication services in the U.S. anymore. Agencies joining the action include the Department of Defense, Homeland Security and Commerce. The recommendation comes after the DOJ found substantial and unacceptable national security risks surrounding China Telecom's operations. The company is the U.S. subsidiary of Chinese state-owned telecom firm China Telecommunications Corporation. The decision allows President Trump setting up a committee to review national security concerns about foreign-owned companies, especially those that want access to U.S. telecommunications networks. U.S. officials are outraged as China is awarded a place on the U.N. Human Rights Council. The representative will help choose who should investigate human rights abuses. Officials asking how that is possible, considering China itself is a serial human rights abuser. U.S. officials are speaking out as China is awarded a place on the U.N. Human Rights Council. In a letter to the U.N. Secretary General, seven senators questioning how China, a serial human rights abuser itself, could oversee the protection of human rights around the world. The CCP representative will help choose human rights investigators who will look at freedom of speech, enforced disappearance and arbitrary detention, rights abuses which the Chinese regime routinely perpetrates. They say the regime's decision to cover up the CCP virus outbreak alone violates any credibility on human rights. Congressman Chris Smith highlighting even more serious abuses. There's a growing body of evidence that the Chinese government harvests the organs of political prisoners, providing organs on order for those willing to pay a blood price. An independent tribunal in the UK recently concluded that forced organ harvesting is carried out on religious minorities like Christians, Uyghur Muslims and members of the persecuted spiritual practice Falun Gong. The Chinese regime has severely persecuted Falun Gong since 1999, with hundreds of thousands detained in prisons, labor camps and brainwashing centers. The United States left the Human Rights Council in 2018, then UN Ambassador Nikki Haley calling it a protector of human rights abusers and a cesspool of political bias. And in New York, the hospitalization rate of new patients with the virus is flattening. But for the third time this week, the death toll has reached a record high. NTD's Miguel Moreno has more. New York may have reached the plateau this week. Overall, the hospitalization rate is falling, but the good news was dashed with another grim record number of deaths. Uh, this virus is very, very good at what it does. We lost more lives yesterday than we have to date. And the sheer number of bodies has overwhelmed the city. This drone video shows a mass burial underway in Hard Island in the Bronx. The Department of Corrections said about 25 bodies are being buried there five days a week. It's an ugly sight, but New York appears to be doing better than the models predicted. So any of these scenarios are problematic. Luckily, the current trend, if it continues, and if we continue the flattening of the curve, we're at about 18,000 people hospitalized right now. Despite the news, Cuomo and Mayor Bill de Blasio again reminded New Yorkers that it's not over and that they need to continue social distancing. The fact that we've seen some initial change, we shouldn't overrate it. We should not count our chickens before they're hatched. The governor said it could get worse if people relax and talked about the Spanish flu, which killed tens of millions of people in three waves. Miguel Moreno, NTD News, New York. The number of U.S. service people infected by the virus is increasing, but the military says it hasn't affected its combat readiness. 
The Pentagon on Wednesday reported its largest 24-hour jump in new virus cases among service members. This brings the force-wide total to nearly 2,000, a number that has doubled in the past week. But given our type, uh, demographics of our population, we will also have a lower hospitalization rate. The military is still combat ready despite reduced training, exercises and sideline aircraft carrier. The carrier is the USS Theodore Roosevelt, its 4,800-man crew still being tested, about 400 already testing positive and over 3,000 testing negative, planning now underway for possible outbreaks on other ships. And the Pentagon today forced to refute media reports that its National Center for Medical Intelligence knew about the virus sweeping through Wuhan, China as early as November. The info supposedly included in the November internal report. But in a rare public statement, the NCMI says the claims are false, that no such report exists. Indications we have were the reports out of China in late December that were in the public forum, and the first intel reports I saw were in January. The sources for the original media report were all anonymous. And a divided Senate today in Washington. The chamber failed to pass an additional $250 billion in aid for small businesses, even as a news report reveals skyrocketing unemployment rates. According to new Department of Labor figures, U.S. unemployment claims soared to a near record high of over 6 million last week. That means, Mr. President, more than 16 million Americans have lost their jobs in only the last three weeks. A tragedy that is hard to even comprehend. As lockdowns continue to drive layoffs, an additional $250 billion aid package is working its way through Congress. It's meant to help small businesses cope with the pandemic's economic toll. But on Thursday, the Senate failed to pass it. Democrats objected to a Republican measure aimed at beefing up emergency loans for small businesses. They argued they'd only back the bill if it was coupled with a similar amount for hospitals, local governments and food assistance. To my Democratic colleagues, please, please do not block emergency aid you do not even oppose just because you want something more. But Republicans say only the money in a small business loan program was at risk of running out right now and needs to be replenished. It was designed to help struggling restaurants, hotels and an array of other small businesses. Both sides called for nonpartisanship to get the aid to struggling Americans. But let's get it done and let's get it done right. And let's have another 96 to nothing vote here in the United States Senate. So with most of Congress out on a recess, each side tried to push its respective bill through the Senate on a fast track. That means it took only one objection from any of the 100 senators to shelf either plan. And in a small step toward reopening the country, the CDC issued guidelines allowing essential workers who have been exposed to the CCP virus to go back to work as long as they are feeling well and they take certain precautions. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention issued a new guidance for essential workers who have been exposed to the CCP virus, also known as the coronavirus. CDC Director Robert Redfield said the employee can return to work as long as they take their temperature before they go to work, wear a face mask at all times, and practice social distancing in their workplace. He warned that people must not go back to work if they are sick. Other guidelines include advice about how to stay safe at work. We want them not to share objects that would be touching their face and we would like them not to congregate in break rooms, lunch rooms and crowded places. The new guidelines allow essential workers without any symptoms to go back to work instead of staying home because they've had exposure. Redfield said the guidelines apply to individuals that have been within six feet of a confirmed case or a suspected case of the virus. The guidelines also state that employers should check the temperature of employees and assess their symptoms before starting them back at work. Other guidelines include increasing airflow in the building and cleaning common areas more regularly. Anyone found to be unwell should be sent home immediately. The World Health Organization is set to request over a billion dollars in funding to fight the CCP virus pandemic. It comes after criticism by the Trump administration that the organization did not do its job effectively and spread false information about the virus. 
The WHO says it will put together a new funding plan to fight the CCP virus. Diplomats say the organization will request up to several billion dollars. WHO Director General Tedros Adamon Ghebreyesus said Thursday the organization would release its latest plan in the coming days. On Tuesday and Wednesday, President Trump expressed dissatisfaction with the WHO. He said faulty statements the WHO made in January spread inaccurate information about the virus around the world. The World WHO, World Health, got it wrong. I mean, they got it very wrong. In many ways, they were wrong. They also uh, minimized the threat very strongly and uh, not good. Trump highlighted that the WHO spread misinformation put out by the Chinese communist regime that there was no human-to-human transmission despite having information to the contrary. The U.S. is the largest financial contributor to the WHO. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said organizations supported by taxpayer funds must deliver on their promises. Trump and Pompeo said the U.S. would evaluate the effectiveness of the WHO and decide if the funding will continue. Moving to the U.K. news from London tonight that the U.K.'s prime minister is out of intensive care but remains in hospital. He's been suffering from the CCP virus after testing positive more than 10 days ago. Our U.K. correspondent Jane Wirrell has more. An update on Boris Johnson's health tonight. He has been moved out of intensive care to the hospital ward and is said to be in extremely good spirits. No further details have been released about his health. Johnson's last public appearance outside before going to hospital was last Thursday when he joined the UK's weekly clap for healthcare workers. Since going into intensive care, he asked Dominic Raab to deputise for him and lead the UK's response to the crisis. During Thursday's briefing, Raab urged the public to stay at home saying the measures were not done yet. Thank you for your sacrifice, but also we're not done yet. We must keep going. He says lockdown measures will be in place until at least the end of next week, as it's unclear when the UK will be beyond the peak. Jane Worrell, NTD News, London. Daily UK death have increased by 881, meaning the total death toll in the UK is nearing 8,000. Behind each number, of course, is a real life, their families and their friends. CCP virus cases are still rising worldwide, but thankfully the curve is starting to flatten in some European countries. Russia reported a record one-day rise in virus cases on Thursday, bringing their country's total to more than 10,000. But in some European countries, the rise in confirmed cases is starting to slow down. Italy may start lifting some restrictions by the end of April, provided the slowing trend continues. Germany's health minister said restrictions are working and that their curve is flattening. German Chancellor Angela Merkel said on Thursday that their latest numbers allowed for some hope. However, she cited the head of the Robert Koch Institute when she said there is no reason to relax because we can quickly destroy what we have achieved. In the Spanish city of Madrid, roads are unusually empty during Holy Week. The military is advancing its disinfection efforts and using drones to disinfect streets. Bored sports fans, take note. The only professional sports league still going in Europe is the Belarusian Premier League. Belarus's authoritarian president has shown little regard for the pandemic. Now you can buy a virtual ticket to watch the game, and your photo will even appear on a mannequin inside the stadium. The money raised will be donated towards fighting the coronavirus. They are the least comfortable seats on the airplane, and now Delta isn't even booking them anymore. The middle seats, it's an effort to create a little more distance between passengers to try and prevent the spread of the virus. No middle seats through the end of May, and they're also going to put a pause on automatic advanced seat upgrades to make sure people have enough space. Delta and other airlines have been slashing schedules with fewer and fewer people flying. And rideshare drivers' income is down 80 percent across the country. Many drivers are off the road altogether to protect against health risks. But at least one in New York is still helping essential workers get where they need to go. NTD's Kevin Hogan has the story. Across the country, rideshare drivers losing about 80 percent of their income due to lockdowns caused by the pandemic. Four hire vehicles are an essential business. Raul, a registered taxi and limousine commission or TLC driver, is hitting the streets. He doesn't turn away any passengers coming or going from the hospital. I don't, I don't panic when I go to a hospital and I'm picking somebody up. I just pick them up. I don't, I don't uh, discriminate. I just pick up. doesn't matter where they're going. I just pick them up. 
He doesn't advise anyone to do what he does, but he says he chooses to do it because it feels good to help his fellow New Yorkers. So we went over to Far Rockaway, we, we, we delivered the, the asthma medication, stood there for a few minutes, and I brought her right back to the Bronx, and she was thankful. Many rideshare drivers calling it quits to protect their health, and some because there just aren't enough fares. Raul says the city has lost doctors, nurses, police officers, and taxi drivers to the virus. That's what we're losing. We're losing New Yorkers. And I feel, uh, I get emotional when I talk about it like that because I'm one. I'm not Superman. It can happen to me too. Some New Yorkers say the safest way to travel is on foot, bicycle, or taxi to avoid crowds. If you have to travel, I think walking would be the best way, obviously keeping a six-foot distance. Um, but if you're going to do something, maybe a bicycle. The trains are really a pain in the neck right now because they cut the service drastically, so every train I've been on in the past two weeks has been overcrowded. One woman who recovered from the virus now works from home. It's like I lost my sense of smell and taste and had some breathing issues, you know, all the stuff. So my husband got it as well. So. Raul says now that less cars are on the street and less police are out patrolling, more motorists are speeding. As a member of Families for Safe Streets, and as a crash survivor, he asked them to stop driving recklessly and for pedestrians to be safe when they're out so that we don't send more to the hospital. Thanks, Raul. Kevin Hogan, NTD News reporting. Here at China In Focus, we bring you first-hand information from inside China. Don't forget to subscribe for the latest updates.